kids sing has started talking about Samson. And Samson is often looked at as one of the superheroes in the Bible. His, his divine strength that he used, the leadership. Um, Samson wasn't a perfect man, not uh, necessarily one of the highest moral character, but we identify him with kind of a modern day superhero. Superheroes dominate the media today with the uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe being the biggest box offer, box office blockbusters of all time. That's not easy to say. They're popular. They are uh, relatable. All of the superheroes that we de- see depicted on the big screen and in the comic books, they, they have their flaws. They have these ways that we relate to them, and so we root for them and we want them. But they're, they're more than us. They're bigger than us. They're stronger than us. They're smarter than us. They're something special. And I have to admit, Asher is a big fan right now of superheroes. Just superheroes this, superheroes that. Thor is his favorite right now. Some of the superheroes are even depicted as being gods. I've seen it and it's, it's I would say, worrying to me. It is concerning that some in our society even are taking this to the extreme of what we might have called last week we studied those devotions that that Paul mentioned in Acts chapter 17 that was Wednesday night some have even gone to the extreme of a form of worship of these fictional superhero characters they they hang on every move every new movie or every new comic book we have something better we have something that is perfect there's no flaws in our superhero. Jesus is the one through whom salvation has come. He is the only one in whose name salvation can be found. And He is truly flawless. He is God in the flesh. He is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our emulation. He will never let us down. He will never fail to save us. But He's not the only superhero. And I know that Like I said this morning, I try to talk a lot about faith. Faithfulness in action. Our lives of discipleship, our lives of faith will be judged by our faithfulness at the end of time. And so we need some examples to look to. Our faith often wavers. We struggle. I hope she doesn't mind me calling her out, but Miss Carol Alexander told me that she's been struggling. She gave me a an article that she came across, and I think it's going to make a great sermon. We're going to preach that. But she's admitted that she struggles, and I know if she does, so many of us do. And so I want us to look at the Bible and see some people who struggled as well, but whose faithfulness, whose faith in action can inspire us as well. These are the people that we need to look to as our superheroes. These are the people that we need to study that we need to keep up with, that we need to think about when we're in situations. How, how, how would this person have acted? Hey, there's a story, a biblical story that applies to my situation here. So I've got eight of them, and we'll just be brief with each one. But let's look at what the Bible says about our superheroes of faith. First of all, let us be obedient like Abraham. Abraham was the father of the faithful. God called him out of his homeland, out of a land that he was familiar with from his own family. Everything that he knew and loved was in Ur of the Chaldees. And God said, you need to leave. You need to get out of there. I don't don't tell you where you're going, but you've got to get out of where you are. That is a, uh, a predicament. It is a a dilemma that we would be faced with, not knowing where we're going. And Hebrews 11.8 says exactly that. Uh, So many of these can be found in Hebrews chapter 11, but not all of ours are going to come from there. This is really the only one where we're going to refer to a passage here. Hebrews 11 verse 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, not knowing. He went out not knowing whither he went. Can you imagine God asking you to do something and not really telling you where you're going or how you're going to accomplish it or what is expected of you, but you just have to get out of where you are. And really, that's what He is asking us to do. Our sins are comfortable to us. 
The way of life that we build for ourselves, we know it, we love it, we have relationships with people, but sometimes those things are to our detriment. They are harming us spiritually. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is what calls us out of that way of life, 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Are we going to follow the example of Abraham? Abraham's obedience is an obedience that we can emulate. He trusted God so much so that he said, I don't know yet, I don't know how this is going to end, but I trust you, and so I'm going to obey. Are you going to be obedient like Abraham? Are you going to trust like Job? Job was a wealthy man. He was the most wealthy man in all the East, the Bible reveals for us. But in one single day, Job lost everything. He lost all of his cattle, all of his sheep, all of his possessions, his houses, his even the lives of his own children. He lost everything. And if that wasn't enough, later Job is even going to lose his own health. He's going to be covered with boils from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. He loses everything to the point that his wife even says, why don't you just curse God and die? He was afflicted more than any human we ever know has ever been afflicted. Now we suffer, we hurt, we have uh, cancers and, and diseases that we face that are going to test us, they're going to try us. In those situations, are we going to trust like Job trusted? Job says in Job 13 verse 15, <coughs> Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job went through some tough times. That's putting it mildly. And yet he trusted God. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives. He trusted that he would stand at the latter day before the judge. Job didn't know how his life was going to turn out. Didn't know if he would survive this. But he trusted God. He would never acquiesce to what his friends were accusing him of. Job, through it all, demonstrated a great trust. And we attribute patience to Job. And certainly that's, uh, that's right to do so. The Bible calls him a man of patience. But what I see in Job is a model of trust. Who knew that he had lost everything. He knew what he was suffering. And he didn't know how it was going to turn out. But he trusted it would be for the best. And it was. At the end, of course, we know that Job was blessed even greater. God's not promising us physical prosperity. He's not offering us greater wealth through obedience to Him. That's not how He calls us. That's not how He entices us to obey the gospel. But in a similar fashion, we'll be doubly blessed in heaven as we are in comparison to how we are here if we are faithful to Him through whatever life can throw at us. Job is a superhero of the faith because of the way he trusted God through every difficulty. Abraham is a superhero of obedience. Job is a superhero of trust. David is a superhero when it comes to fighting battles. Now we know the, the battle that he fought against Goliath. And we've recently examined that. 1 Samuel chapters 17, 18. David fought against overwhelming odds. David, this little young lad, a teenage boy with nothing but a sling and five stones. And Goliath, a man of extreme height, nine feet, nine inches tall, with a sword and a shield that would have weighed as much as David probably did at the time. And yet David said he trusted in the Lord. He would fight because he knew that God was going to give him the victory. We know that David was a warrior. We know that he was a great fighter. He wanted to build the temple to God where God would have a, a place where his glory could be exhibited to the entire world. But God wouldn't let David build that because he was a warrior, because his hands had shed so much blood. But I don't want us to necessarily look at a passage there with his battle with Goliath, but I want us to notice something that one of David's wives says. Abigail was a, a woman that showed remarkable character. A woman that is very wise. She's very shrewd in, in her understanding of God's will. And it's something that she says to David that I want us to notice about how we then can fight like David. If we want a superhero, 
to show us how to fight, when to fight. This statement needs to be said of us as well. In 1 Samuel 25, Abigail says to David, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. Remember, Abigail's husband was Nabal, and he was not a good man. And when he died is when David married Abigail. But she says, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. She trusted God. She knew that David would was such a great man, such a great leader, that God's hand was upon him. She knew that the Lord would make for David a sure house. And this is what she says about David's fights, about David's battles, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord. And evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. We need to fight. Faithfulness is about continuing to fight. It's about continuing to put one foot in front of the other every day, no matter how we feel, no matter how difficult it may be. It is about keep moving forward. That's sometimes the greatest battle we'll ever fight. That may be the most difficult war we're ever engaged in, just having the strength to keep going. Abigail says she knows that David is the kind of leader, the kind of king who fights the battles of the Lord. Not every battle has to be fought, but fight the battles of the Lord. Fight the battles over spiritual matters. Fight the battle for your soul against the devil. We are not ignorant of his devices. We know how we're tempted, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We know what difficulties stand in our way. We know what we struggle with. Fight the battles of the Lord. Know that the Lord is on our side when we fight those battles. We cannot lose. And this was the attitude, this was the faith, this was the trust that David demonstrated in his battles against Goliath and against every nation against whom he fought. David trusted the Lord. The Lord fought with him. He fought the battles of the Lord. Some battles aren't battles of the Lord. And we get involved in them. We get caught up in the things of the world. Those are battles that we don't need to even worry about. She said about David that evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. When we're fighting the battles of the Lord, then hopefully this can be said of us, that we're people of moral purity, upright in character, ones who care only about seeing righteousness done. No matter what it costs me, no matter how it might hurt me, I'm going to fight the battles of the Lord because even if I lose and the Lord gains, that is all that matters. This was the attitude with which David fought. And so fight like David. He's a superhero of faith when it comes to fighting the battles of the Lord. Be obedient like Abraham, trust like Job, fight like David, pray like Daniel. And I know there may be other examples that we could go of for prayer. So many great fervent prayers are recorded for us in Scripture, but One of my favorites is the prayer of Daniel that's recorded in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel by this point is ancient in days. He is uh, maybe even close to 100 years old. And throughout the book of Daniel, we've known him since he was a teenager. It's my understanding that these nations, when they would capture people and bring these young men in and make them eunuchs, I believe that's what happened to Daniel, they were looking for boys around 14 years old. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego may have been taken into captivity when they were about 14. And now he's about 100 years old. He's been in Babylonian service all that time. He has known life in Babylon more than he knew ever in Jerusalem. And he remained true and faithful to God through all of that. He knew Jeremiah. He was reading Jeremiah's writings about the captivity and how it was about to come to a close. The 70 years were up. Daniel knew that. And he had seen everything his nation had been through. He had seen Jerusalem destroyed. We learn and we grow with Daniel throughout this book so that by the time we come to this prayer, it ought to tear at our heart to hear what he has to say, to hear how he expresses concern for his own people. And so when we get in tough times, when we struggle, when our faith is being tested, pray like Daniel. He has lived a lifetime of faithfulness. And this is how he prays near the end of his life, beginning in verse 4, Daniel chapter 9. 
And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love Him and to them that keep His commandments. He loves those who remain faithful to Him. We have sinned, He says in verse 5. Now he's speaking on behalf of all his people because he loves them, because he's watching them, because he's seen what they've been through. And he knows they have not been faithful to God in his covenant. He says, we have sinned. And he includes himself in the number. We don't have any sins attributed to Daniel. He's one of the few characters in the Bible where we have no flaws revealed. He was always doing what was right. But he says, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets. Daniel certainly had. He's praying this prayer because he realizes what Jeremiah had written. Neither have we hearkened to thy servants the prophets which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. There's no excuse. Our predicament is inexcusable. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. But he doesn't blame God. Even for the situation in which he finds himself, he doesn't blame God. He says, you're doing this because you're righteous. We need this. We confess to you our sins. Righteousness belongs unto thee, but unto us, it is only righteous that confusion of faces belongs. That's what we deserve. But unto us confusion of faces as at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off throughout all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. You are righteous, you are holy, and we sin. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers because we have sinned against thee. When we are at our wit's end, when we're at the end of our rope. Pray to God like Daniel, confessing sin, admitting, confessing that He is the one who is righteous and that our salvation will only come through Him. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against Him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk by His laws, which He set before us by His servants, the prophets." This old man is pouring his heart out in prayer to God. And we know how committed he was to praying. It almost cost him his life. That's why he was thrown into the den of lions. So when we need help, when we need strength, remember Daniel. Pray like Daniel. Work like Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to King Ahasuerus. And he, much like Jeremiah was a very emotional man. I see this. And that's what uh, the king of Persia noticed about Nehemiah. He said, your countenance is falling. What's going on? Why are you so upset? He says, people are back in Jerusalem. They've gone back to restore the temple. But the walls are still laying there on the ground. We're defenseless. And it had bothered him to the degree that he couldn't perform his duties for the king the way he normally did. The king took notice and sent Nehemiah back. And once he was there, of course, the condition of the city just broke his heart even more. But the people, Nehemiah 4 verse 6, the people had a mind to work. They were committed to rebuilding the walls. And so when we are in a tight spot, when we're wondering what to do next, have a mind to work. Get to work for God. That will solve a lot of our ills. It will cure a lot of what's wrong with our thinking when we have a mind to work. We're not focused on what's wrong. We're not thinking about the difficulties when we're busy doing what is right for each other. The people had a mind to work. And in Nehemiah 4, verses 17 and 18, this is the attitude. This is how they had to fight. This is how they had to build. They which build on the wall and they that bear burdens with those that laid it, everyone with one of his hands wrought in the work, hammer in one hand and with the other hand held a weapon, a sword in the other. They had to defend themselves from their enemies, from their attackers, but they had to get the work done too. Work like Nehemiah. This man is a superhero of faith when it comes to a work ethic, when it comes to a desire to do what is right, to rebuild, to restore. 
to regain what was lost. Verse 18, For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side and so builded, and he that sounded the trumpet was by me. Nehemiah had to organize. He was a leader among these, but the people had a mind to work. Get to work. Let us have the same attitude toward this, toward the work of the Lord that Nehemiah and the people did. These are our superheroes. These are the people we need to be emulating. Work like Nehemiah, serve like our Lord. We think about his act of service in John chapter 13, and I'm not sure we can properly appreciate just how lowly of a task this was when he washed his own disciples' feet. That would have been shameful among many of those whom Jesus had associated with. Remember he ate on occasions in the homes of tax collectors of, um, uh, or, or even other leaders in Israel at the time. Those prominent members of society, if they had seen Jesus doing this, would have thought it shameful. But Jesus got down on his hands and knees. He removed his outer garment. He got a basin of water and he washed, he scrubbed the feet of every one of his disciples. And he was their Lord and he was their master. And they were to bow down to him and follow every word and be obedient to him no matter what. And he said, you call me Lord and master and you're right for so I am there in John chapter 13. But if you're going to be like me, you follow my example here. But what I want us to notice is found in Philippians chapter 2. We know about Jesus' great service, but think about the description here of his humility, of how he humbled himself in order to become a servant. Philippians 2 beginning in verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That should be enough right there. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the one to whom all these others uh, fail to compare favorably. They're, they don't even live up to the example set by Jesus in every one of these areas. Jesus is God in the flesh. And so we are instructed to have the mind, have the heart of Jesus. Think about the things that he thought about. Desire, care about the things that, that he says are important. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He was on an equality with God. In heaven, he had heaven. He was there. He had every blessing. There was no sin. There was no death. There was no decay. He was in heaven. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Yes, he got down and washed his disciples' feet, but that was an act of humility. He lowered himself willingly because he loved us. There is no greater example of service than when Jesus left heaven to come to earth. Let us have that same heart, that same desire, that same mindset to serve those around us. No one is beneath us. No one is below our feet. No one is less than us. Paul said, esteem each other better than yourselves. That's the way Jesus looked at life. Let us then see Jesus as our superhero when it comes to service. And let us speak like Paul. Now, I know some say, well, I can't preach. I can't stand up there. That's, that's not for me. And even you ladies especially, I can't do that. I'm not permitted to. And that's fine. But that's not what I'm talking about. Paul would never fail to share the gospel with someone. That was what his whole life was about. He didn't need a public pulpit. He didn't need a public forum. He didn't need to be up on stage with everyone looking at him. That's the kind of attitude we need to have toward evangelism, toward sharing this message that can transform a life, that can save a soul from death, that can guarantee him heaven. Why would we not want to share that with someone? Paul shared it. It didn't matter if he was chained to a Roman soldier. As we often point out, he was going to share the message. When he stood before Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, he, he is eloquent. He explains, he, he sets forth the evidence that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but he's bound. 
He's standing there in chains. And in response to what Paul has said on this occasion, King Agrippa uses the word Christian, one of the only three times in the New Testament we find this word specifically. King Agrippa says, verse 28, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You're very close, or would you do this in such a short time? Agrippa understood everything that had gone on. He knew the evidence. He knew what the prophets had said. And Paul appealed to that. And I believe that Agrippa is saying here, I see what you're saying. I understand the evidence, and I'm just not willing to make that commitment. And so Paul says this in verse 29. This is the way we need to speak. I would to God that not only thou, but all them that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. He said, I've got something you do not have. I've got something greater than anything you could ever offer me. And I wish that you could have it. And I wish everyone that will hear me this day could have it. It has nothing to do with these bonds. I may be bound here in this forum, in this arena, but I am the Lord's free man. He has set me free. Let us speak like Paul. He knew how to share the message with everyone. Let us have that same love of the gospel, love of the truth, love of what Jesus has done for us. Paul is our example, our superhero when it comes to speaking that glorious message. And let us stand like Peter. I don't know why I'm getting emotional about this. No matter how many times Peter got knocked down, he got back up. No matter how many mistakes he made, no matter how many times he put his foot in his mouth, Peter got back up. And he stood with the Lord. After he denied him on the night of his crucifixion, on the night of his trial, Luke records that after the rooster crowed, the Lord turned and looked at Peter, reminding him, it would seem, of what he had said to him. Peter had said, though everyone denies you, I'll never deny you, I'll die with you. And the Lord said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times tonight. And when the Lord turned and looked at Peter, Peter went out and wept bitterly. But Peter didn't give up. Peter didn't lay down his cross. Peter didn't go out and hang himself like Judas had. Peter would go on to become a great preacher, a humble man, and a faithful servant of God so that he could write in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. He lists this first, his role as an elder in the church First, And I believe he's listing these in, in order of honor, in order of humble service, that he took the most, I don't want to use the word pride, that he took the most glory in serving in these offices. I believe he lists them in the order that he found the most service in. Elder first, which who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, an apostle and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. A Christian. He was an elder, an apostle, and a Christian. After everything he had been through, all the mistakes he had made, he was able to exhort Christians as all three of those roles. And then he says in verse 6, and again, coming from Peter, here near the end of his life, as he's grown older, as he has been through all of these trials and difficulties and learn that God is no respecter of persons, he says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Bow down and he will lift you up to stand. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. We have superheroes that we need to look at, that we need to emulate, that we need to model our lives after found right here in God's Word. How much time are we spending with them? How much time do we spend with these modern superheroes who all have flaws, who all have weaknesses, none of whom are perfect? And none of these men either were, 
And the Bible reveals that except for our Lord and Savior. So won't you bow the knee to Him? Won't you give your life to Him? Won't you ask Him to forgive you of your sins? He will. If you will give Him all of your heart, if you will trust Him until the end, if you'll walk faithfully until death, He'll give you the crown of life. But you have to repent. You have to say, I wish I'd never committed those sins and, and brought shame and reproach upon God. I wish that I had lived faithful to Him from birth. You have to repent of those sins. You have to confess Jesus Christ. You have to be immersed in water in the name of Jesus Christ to contact His blood. And that's where your sins are washed away. You can do that today. Don't wait. Don't delay. He is the only one who can save you. And if you've done that, but you recognize you've been weak, you've stumbled, you've stopped walking, you've stopped moving forward in your life of faithfulness, something is blocking your way, repent and confess we want to help you in any way that we can. But if you have need, come forward and make it known as we stand and sing.